I'm Joan Cool. I'm an author and workplace consultant around advancing women in the workplace and workplace inclusivity. And I am so thrilled to have been on a journey with Sparks, specifically Christy Alisano, your chief marketing officer in this world of trying to bring stronger connections, confidence, and empower the women in your organization and beyond. So through the Owning It newsletter, we're going to feature success stories of your colleagues at every level talking about how they've broken through barriers that have inhibited their confidence, but also really helped them build career endurance. So no better person to kick this off than, than Christy, who is the co-founder of Women in Events. She started this movement 13 years ago, but she started her career at Sparks almost 20 years ago. Hard to believe. But Christy, I'm so thrilled that you're sharing your story with everyone. There's a lot in it that it will inspire and empower. So let's start there. Tell us a little bit about this 20-year career journey. Okay, so um, overall, I'm like a pretty easygoing person, but when I feel challenged and I set my heart on something, I kind of go after it full force, which is pretty much the mantra for my entire career at Sparks. So prior to Sparks, I was working at a tech startup in West Virginia, where I was responsible for the company's trade shows. There's my connection. So small shows, 10 by 10s, 10 by 20s, um, and I was traveling around Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Ohio. I loved being on the show floor. And when you go to the same shows, like over and over again, you always run into the same people. So I met so many people from Sparks. I loved them. I always looked forward to seeing them. We became friends on the show floor. So when I turned 24, I decided to move back to Philadelphia. I knew that I wanted to work here. Like that's what I wanted. This was my spot. I didn't apply anywhere else. I was going to work at Sparks. So for months, I basically stalked the then marketing director. Through my show friends, I knew that Scott and Jeff had just come in and bought the company and that they were making a lot of changes. So I felt like it was a really good time to kind of open the door for myself and and stick my foot in. And I was relentless about it. I sent resumes back with every person I saw on the show floor. I called and mailed and faxed my resume a dozen times at least. Um, I actually ended up speaking with the marketing director twice. She did not like me. (laughs) She clearly was not interested in having me on her team, but I did not care. Um, I kept calling, I kept sending things. And eventually one day I called HR and I just asked if there was anyone in the sales department that I could speak to. And I ended up speaking with the then sales director, Alan. And I spoke to Alan for about a half hour. And in that conversation, he told me that the then marketing director was actually out on vacation for two weeks and that they were indeed looking for like a marketing coordinator, marketing assistant position to support she and he, and I convinced him to interview me. So I ended up flying up to Philadelphia the following week. Uh, She was still on vacation and I met with Alan and we had this great interview and he hired me the next day. So that was my into Sparks. It started with me knowing that I wanted to be there. I was going to do anything I I could do to be here. And I did that. So Alan hires me and I start working at Sparks. And I came into a role of, I guess it was kind of like a marketing assistant, marketing coordinator. And I was focused on kind of supporting both Alan and Marianne at the time. And my day-to-day was really kind of doing RFPs, which kind of still is my day-to-day. But at the time, it was just the three of us in the sales support and marketing departments. So about six months after I started, um, the marketing director, who still didn't like me at the time, left. And I was only 25. And I was only person, like at that point, the only person in the marketing department, um, but now with a manager title. So of course I saw that as an opportunity and I jumped in to do as much as I could to kind of cover her role. I was reporting then to Jeff Harrow and uh, he eventually sat me down and told me that they were planning to hire another marketing director and potentially a VP of marketing. And like, I'm 25, right? So I have all this confidence and I'm like, um, why can't this be me, right? Like, why can't I be that person? And I will never forget this conversation because it was definitely the jumping off point for the rest of my career at Sparks. But I tried to convince Jeff that it should be me and that he shouldn't hire somebody else. And he literally laughed at me and was like, you really think you can do this? And that was it for me. That was like my defining moment. Like not a huge fan of NSYNC, but my (laughs) internal dialogue right then was, it's gonna be me. Like, I'm gonna do this. I'm going to be the VP of marketing for this company. It became like my career direct trajectory plan in an instant. I was going to do it. So they did end up hiring a VP 
And she lasted in the role for like two years. Um, but at that time, I continued to like make sure that I was super visible and that Jeff and Scott knew what I was doing, what I was working on. And I worked really hard on creating relationships with them and with the other department heads to make sure that they knew, you know, what I was capable of, what I could offer, how I could help them. And I just kind of forced myself, if you will, on everyone, right? So eventually um, in like 2005, the person that they hired moved on to a different position. And like, that was my shot. I knew that like, and this is my biggest takeaway in this entire story, everybody. I knew like that was my opportunity. So I walked in and I told Jeff that I wanted to be the director of marketing and business development. I was going to oversee both of these areas and he did not need to replace uh, the person that had just moved out of that position. I prepared like unbelievably for this conversation. I rehearsed it. I did the work. You know, I had my facts. I had all of the backup and all the work that I had done over the past couple of years of why this should be me. Um, I was very clear about what my weaknesses were and what I knew I needed to work on, but I was prepared for everything that he could come back with. Right. So I got that promotion and Jeff probably remembers the conversation totally differently, and I'd love to speak to him about it someday, but I got that promotion, right? But at the time, we had just bought um, Showtime Enterprises, which came with a new EVP of sales and marketing. So I was a little bummed at that because all of a sudden there was a ceiling again, right? Like I had this VP role, I'm sorry, I had this director role, yeah. and now there's this EVP. So like, what did that mean for me kind of stepping into that VP role, which was my trajectory plan? Oops, Sorry about that. So then anyway, uh, we just bought Showtime Enterprises and it wasn't that big of a deal because the EVP was awesome. He really knew my strengths and what I could do. And he allowed me to continue leading the day to day. Um, he just became someone new to report to other than Jeff, which was great. I continued to like earn raises and bonuses um, over the next several years. And I was eventually promoted to vice president of marketing in 2012. So again, my big takeaway with this is that promotion, every promotion, including the one to CMO in 2021, came on the back of a conversation that I initiated with my boss. So I had to step up. I had to be my biggest advocate. Yes, I had people that saw how hard I worked and that knew me and were friends with me and would speak on my behalf. But I had to step in and I had to initiate that conversation. And that is the truth for every single promotion and raise and title change that I've had over the 20 years here at Sparks. And that's why I'm so focused on having this kind of overarching theme of this women's and experiential initiative really center on being an effective self-advocate. Like you cannot sit back and wait for people to hand you your career. That was my big thing. I was going to take it. I was going to own it. I was going to become that vice president of marketing. And I had to step up and do that. So my career advice, if you will, kind of wrap up my career story is like, you have to visualize it, right? You have to plan it. You have to believe that you deserve it and you have to know what you want, but believing in yourself isn't always enough, right? You have to gather that supporting evidence. You have to get your facts and you have to write your story and then you have to open your mouth and you have to tell someone what you want because no one's going to hand it to you. You have to go and you have to take it. You have to own it which is why I want to call this whole initiative, owning it, right? Being your best self-advocate. That was remarkable. I mean, it's inspiring in so many ways, but the headlines, it, you know, if you will, um, being relentless is, is grounded in that self-belief. Yeah. And what I also like about what you said, which I hope women really hear is there's a false notion that you know, you're tapped on the shoulder, here you go, here's this great thing, or that just having a great manager and mentors and sponsors, which you need, are going to also open up doors. Mm -hmm. It, you need that piece where you are the one driving your career. And I know at times in our life, that can be really exhausting and daunting. But the fact that you have really spent time over and over again, getting clear on your strengths, being open about where you're trying to develop, but we know that our strengths are what accelerate our development more than even just focusing on our weaknesses. Research proves that. So I really appreciate that story in so many ways. I also appreciate the late 90s, early 20, 2000s <laughs> pop references. <laughs> Brings us back uh, and just showcases the journey itself. So now 
when you hear that story and you see your tremendous title, chief marketing officer, and I know how big your job is and your world is. Um, and when you recap it like that, which most people have never had an opportunity to actually speak out loud about their journey and, and reflect on it. It's, you know, you're confident, you're compelling, you're articulate. Um, but we also know that no matter what it looks like on the outside, many of us have really battled this phenomena called imposter syndrome. And it's the first barrier that we tackle in owning it because women of all different industries, all different levels and profiles say, I've got this pervasive self-doubt. It makes me question if I belong in this room. It makes me question if I can do this job, let alone raise my hand for something bigger. And so even though I know it's going to be hard to believe that you may have ever even struggled with this or even today, I would love your experience, any stories you can share about imposter syndrome. Yeah. So the funniest part about that, right, in my career story, telling that story is that I do come off as confident in that story, right? I went and I asked for each opportunity that I felt I deserved. All of that is laced with self-doubt, right? There are so many times in those moments that I had the, well, why, why, why would you want to hire someone over me? Why aren't you thinking of me for this position, right? So there's definitely that throughout my entire career, but I got myself to a point where I knew if I wanted it, I had to take it. Nobody was going to give it to me. And that was a hard life lesson for me, right? That was something, thankfully, I put myself in a position with this company, um, to be surrounded by such great people and such great management that once you do tell your story, they, they believe in you and they get it and they pull you through, but you do have to kind of own that fear. So like for me today, even I know I'm good at my job. I know that I'm a good team leader. Um, I also know what I don't know. And I know how to surround myself with people who can fill in the gaps um, or I'm willing to go and I'm willing to take a class online or read a book and teach myself what I don't know. But there are so many times throughout my career um, and today that I'm a total hot mess. Like when it comes to any type of public speaking like this, I'm an absolute disaster. Um, I'm sure you guys, if you didn't notice it, I notice it as I'm telling my career story, like my voice dips low and I can hear myself shaky a little bit. And that stuff drives me crazy. I am the absolute worst public speaker. I hate any type of public, public speaking. Um, I am not good in the moment. That's something I know about myself. It's something I actively try to work on, but I have such agita around any situation like this. Um, speaking on video is a nightmare for me. And um, talking in client presentations, when I give the LGO presentations, I feel like I'm having a heart attack the entire time. Um, Anytime I've been asked to sit on an industry panel or speak at women's events, when we do women in events, I always ask Robin or previously Jane or someone else to do the introductions, even though it's so important to me and I have so much to share and so much to say, I cannot be the one to stand on that podium and have everyone look at me like I die. I literally die. So. You'd never know. You'd never <laughs> know. And I think that like the absolute you worst. You pull through though, the, that, that, that value that you have really two values that you constantly and consistently show up with, which is one, like I deserve to be here. I did this. I started this initiative. I got this job. I got this client. I got to walk through that door. And then the second part of it is, you know, it, it, it is just the, the fact that you're being vulnerable enough to share that, to remind everyone that we don't see you shaking. We don't see any, yeah. any hair out of place. Even right oh. now, my heart's like, whoa, like I hate, I hate these scenarios. And it's something that I've struggled with throughout my entire career. And I still struggle with, I have to push through them and it's hard, but that's kind of in my 45, you know, years of life, this being my 45th year of life, this is my focus on myself. This is something that I know is so limiting for me. Yeah. It's kind of put the, the end stop on my career because from here as a CMO, um, I want to be out there. I want to be on a stage. I want to be sharing my story. I want to be helping women. I want to be part of the conversation that's going on around me in our industry and in other industries because that's what's next for me. But I am my own kind of wall on that right now. I'm limiting myself. But so that yeah. is that is where my imposter syndrome comes in. I kind of have that feeling of if I don't say the right thing or if I don't know the right thing to say, you know, people around me are going to look at me like I'm some fraud and that's where I fail, right? So that's 
that's something that I'm actively working on. And that's my big kind of limiting secret, if you will. But I think the headline is that we have learned that overcoming imposter syndrome, because it doesn't actually go away for some people. And it's actually a really helpful sign that something's important to you. Something's meaningful for you. The, the, the big takeaway is that to overcome it, you do not have to change who you are. You do not have to actually gain a new skill. It's owning your success as it is. And I think that couldn't be more reflective of the journey that you're on. And then everybody hearing that, you know, some of the most successful achieving people in the world still deal with this. But when you have a tool, you have some reminders and a real you know, a real drive as you're talking about to not let things hold you back from what you deserve, you know, then, then you put yourself out there and, and you realize everybody else is human too. So I, I love that. And I think it couldn't be more reflective of, of how you've gotten to where you are today. Uh-huh. The other piece of you, besides yeah. all we know that you do at work is that's not your whole self, right? You're a mother, uh-huh. you're in a dual career partnership. Um, and so, Part of owning it, we we want to recognize the diverse identities of, of women across Sparks. Um, we all have a ton of different roles and hats we play outside the workplace that tug at our time and demand of our energy. So I love hearing a little bit about how you bring your human to work, even what how you figured out that that was necessary. You know, for you to be successful at work is also being who you are at home. Yeah, so I am most importantly a mom, right? Before all else, that is my number one job. It's the thing that means the most to me. I am so proud of my daughter. She's 10 this week, actually. So I'm I'm so proud of who she is and the role that I've played in getting her to where she is. Like, it's so important to me to be her mom. So then, you know, as you go through this program with us and you're learning more about imposter syndrome, we talk about different imposters, right? For me, um, I'm like the superwoman imposter where I feel like I have to be the best mom. I have to be the best wife. I have to be the best CMO. I have to be the best friend. And if I fall, you know, in any of those areas, I feel like I fail at all of them. So that's that's something else with imposter syndrome that I'm working through is this kind of superwoman part. But the way that I've dealt with that specifically in my work is I have to show up as a human, right? I have to show up as this whole person. I am not somebody who comes to work and pretends that I don't have a family. I have a family. I have a daughter. I have a husband. I have dogs. I have you know, my mom who's crazy and I love her, but I, she calls me 900 times a day. I have all these other parts of my life that make me who I am. And I have to be comfortable bringing those forward. So for me, and again, with, with Jeff as, you know, my, my kind of boss position, if you will, um, I talk to Jeff a lot and I'm very open with Jeff about what's going on with me. If he's like, what's going on today, I'm on my way to the dentist. I had to take my daughter in. It's not, um, ever trying to pretend that I am not that, or that that's a weakness in my life. I am 100% who I am, mom, wife, you know, daughter, sister, all of those things. And I feel like, especially in today's society, it's okay to be that at work. So I promised myself early on, you know, if I was ever in a position in this company, because obviously I knew that I was going to spend my career at this company, and I've done that. Um, Early on, I promised myself um, that if I was ever in a position to manage other people, that I would make sure that our days were structured in such a way that they felt that same way, that they knew they were allowed to be human and that they could bring their whole selves to work and they didn't have to take a sick day because their child needed to be home from school and they needed to be home too, or that they needed to use, you know, only the one lunch hour that they have because they haven't had an opportunity to get their hair cut. That stuff doesn't, doesn't work with me on my team. You have to be a human. You have to be your whole self. And as long as you're comfortable being honest with me and communicating with me on what you really need, we're going to make that happen. So I wanted my, everyone on my team really to feel like, you know, their whole lives mattered to me, not just their work lives. And I think I've done that. Um, If you talk to my team members, I think they feel pretty comfortable being who they are and sharing who they are with me. And in the end, I feel like that just makes us such a better team. And we produce so much more, you know, 
positive energy and great work around what we do together because we all know each other as human, not just as this person we work with or my coworker, and we support each other in all areas of our lives. So from a manager's standpoint, that's my management style. I know it's not everybody's, but it was important for me to be my whole self and for everyone that I work with to be able to kind of bring them their whole selves forward to our jobs. Beautifully said. I also think that without a doubt, that is the way to lead and the leader that's going to sustain success in the future. It is a world of different identities and different demands on our lives. And we also know that the research backs it up, that when you allow people to be their whole selves and you start to learn what that means of how they experience their day-to-day, whatever goes on their life, it translates into your customer connection. It it generates consumer insights. That's why also your leadership example as a woman at an executive level and making sure that not only women advance in title, but even if you are in your entry-level job at Sparks, that you are seen, heard, and valued. So I think you live that and breathe that. And we, we should share more of those, those examples throughout owning it. Um, the last uh, two things to wrap up, because I could talk to you for days, is your relationships has been a key value, uh, you know, a cornerstone factor of your success. I get to see, I get to feel like family whenever I travel with you in Sparks because you are all so close and so inclusive. Um, so I, I, if there's any story or even a, a sentiment or a piece of advice that you have about how crucial relationships have been for you to share with this group. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. So one is, and this is kind of more of an advice piece, You know, a lot of people when they're young or they're new to a job or they're in a role that has a very specific hierarchy, um, people tend to feel like they can't have relationships with other, you know, executives or other superiors or other managers. And that is bullshit. So for me, coming in at 24, 25, Um, Number one, I was just kind of new to the corporate world because (laughs) I only had one job before that, but I think it it benefited me because it was very important for me to know Scott and Jeff and shortly after David and Harold and, um, you know, Paul was our head of creative at that time. And I wanted to be, I'm sorry, Ed first and then Paul, I wanted to know these people and I wanted them to know me. And I didn't think twice about trying my best to create relationships with them. So whether it was like saying hi or going out of my way to like ask if they needed something or stopping by and just like telling a funny joke or whatever it was, it was important to me to create relationships with people who weren't my direct boss. And I think not only does that help in visibility um, throughout the company, but as things change and new opportunities arise and you know, maybe new positions open up, there's other people thinking about you. So, you know, obviously they may not come to you and and say, here's a new job for you, but they may suggest you to someone else, right? So they may, or they may have an opportunity on their team that might be right for somebody like you with your personality or with your, you know, soft skill set. So it doesn't always have to be you to your boss, you know, and it's just about work. Like I think creating relationships in as many areas of a company as you possibly can, just so people know who you are, um, is really beneficial. It's been really beneficial to me in my career. Um, other than that too, you know, there's always this story of like a work wife or a work husband or whatever. And I had that um, with Robin. So <laughs> Robin started, um, Robin Licklider, who is now our CXO, Robin started about, a year after I started. And at the time I was in a marketing manager position and she was hired into a PR manager position and I adored her and she was fabulous from day one. And we created this friendship and we have been on this journey together now for, you know, almost 20 years and her input and her support and her friendship has been, I'm going to get emotional. I know. I know. (laughs) It's been super valuable. So yes. Yeah. No better example. Lift, see that as going, right? Lift as you climb. And that's why yeah. the two of you, when we get together live with the group and, and host this other side of owning it, which is really helping everybody make those meaningful connections. Um, 
you know, there's a deep ad- admiration that you have for each other, but also respect. And, and that's to your point about relationships. We grow together. We, we can push each other. We can open up to each other. And all of that is, is professional and it is personal. And, and that's where um, we bring our whole selves. So I think it's been, it's been extraordinary to watch. And so my, my last wrap up with your success story and, and hearing more about your journey, Christy, is we're just asking a silly question about, is there anything that is like a guilty pleasure, something that you do outside of, of sparks in life, uh, that we wouldn't know about you. So I have a lot that I, you know, a lot of hobbies and stuff that I do, but my guilty, guilty pleasure is I love everything true crime. So I, I read a ton. I read at least two books a month. Um, they're always true crime. <laughs> it's always some oh type of terrified of all of that. <laughs> not like murder, something. All the shows I watch are true crime. I listen to every possible true crime podcast. Oh. And my husband, his joke is, um, you know, every time we meet somebody new or every time we get in a conversation around this stuff, he's the first one to say, look, if I ever disappear, like she did it. <laughs> never find me. And it's so true. <laughs> Oh my God. I love that. That would just make me a more paranoid parent. I am a big scaredy cat when it comes to all that stuff, but I love that about you. Um, well, it's a thrill and uh, I think a real joy to have you open up and share this personal side of you. And now we're on this road to helping all the women around you own it too. Thanks, Christy. Thank you.